BBC WM 95.6, radio for the West Midlands. Uh, lunch with Caroline on BBC WM and today is Real Life Story Day uh, and we're chatting to Jason Evans, a Tamworth man. Uh, now Jason was four when his father Jonathan died from HRV. Now this is uh, after being given contaminated blood to treat his haemophilia. His father was one of thousands who were infected in the late 70s and early 80s but we are still not sure how many died but it's likely to be hundreds. Now Jason is now leading a campaign to find out out how this was able to happen and who should be held accountable. Uh, and let's talk to Jason and get his story this afternoon here on BBC WM. So, first of all, Jason, welcome. Thank you for coming in and uh, talking to us this afternoon. Now, your your dad needed treatment for haemophilia. What what actually is that? If people are kind of like unsure, uncertain, what what is it? Sure. Well, um, yeah. First of all, thanks for having me. Um, so. My father, like thousands of others, had this condition called haemophilia, which is basically a blood clotting disorder, and it's a deficiency of a protein in the blood called factor eight, or in some cases factor nine. And to treat that condition, you replace that missing protein factor in the blood. And in the late 70s, early 1980s, the a new form of treatment that really changed the game called factor concentrate products came on the market. And where this product was different was the previous treatments, they weren't blood transfusions, but they were more along those lines. It was called cryoprecipitate and it was a donation given by someone out of goodwill um, and these were the treatments given. However, what happened with these new products, these were commercial products made by pharmaceutical companies for monetary reasons. And it turned out that the people, the haemophiliacs, mostly using these products, um, all of them, were exposed to hepatitis C. And around 30 to 40 percent were also exposed to HIV and uh, my father was infected with both viruses. So this blood had not been tested, had not been screened, nothing. It, it, it would go from the person straight into the person that needed it. It's, it's very, um, it's a bit more complex than, so first of all, these treatments weren't blood transfusions. We call it the contaminated blood scandal because I think it's perhaps an easy way to put it, but essentially... The difference with these products was that instead of just a single person's blood plasma donation, you were pooling or mixing together is the best way to think of it, literally tens of thousands of donations, um, up to 60,000. There are anecdotal reports of it going into the hundreds of thousands. And the the problem that when you did that was it only took one infected donation to contaminate the entire batch. And so this relatively small risk you'd have from a traditional blood transfusion, uh, which was around 0 0.1 for hepatitis C, when you mix tens of thousands together, it actually became 100% for hepatitis C, the infection risk. And for HIV, it was also very high as well. On top of that, the big problem was that, unlike in this country where we have when people donate blood or blood plasma, they do it as a gesture of goodwill mm. to, to, to help people. Um, but what was going on overseas in the US where we were importing these factor eight products from was people were being paid for their plasma donations. And the, the problem when you do that, uh, when these companies were doing this, was that you give people an incentive to lie about their health status and their lifestyle and, and, and other things. And it also attracts people that are desperate for money that are likely to be uh, an infection risk, such as IV drug users, mm. for example, um, who were known to be high risk, but um, some of the documentary evidence shows were freely accepted and paid for their donations, which went into these products. So your dad received this infected blood and um, how did it how did he know how i mean did 
he get various symptoms? Uh, was he tested and then found out? How did it become apparent that he'd received this infected blood? So his medical records show that he was first confirmed as being HIV positive in late 1984. However, he, nor my mother for that matter, were told about that until mid-1985. And, you know, it was in between that period that my mum and dad actually got married. And so, you know, my mum was obviously very lucky not to be infected herself. And, you know, that story isn't uncommon. You know, the, the many people I've spoken to, almost every single one has this tale of their medical records show that um, it was known they were infected with either hepatitis C, HIV or both um, long before they were actually told about it. And I think that's shocking in itself. It, 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 yeah. it, so the risk to so many people, because, of course, this can be passed on. And uh, I guess if they'd known immediately, OK, it's not going to prevent it being passed on, but it lessens the likelihood in some cases. Sure, I think people were given very bad advice. I mean, it, it's given that perhaps at that time, um, knowledge around some of these things perhaps wasn't as good as it is now, but it was still pretty pretty spot on. Um, and, and I think certainly the risks that were known about the products themselves, um, that the evidence shows, just wasn't relayed to patients. And, and these products were actually known to be dangerous before they ever hit the market. And, um, you know, we have documents that show people were warning that, you know, these products should never, ever hit the market because there was insufficient measures in place to kill the viruses. And, and this was known. And, and so really it was it was a, I don't know whether you'd call it a tragedy or a disaster or what we'd call it, but it was driven essentially by profit and corporations and 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 we want to get to the bottom of it. So if we go back to your dad, he, you, you said him and your mum, they, they got married uh, around that time. So you weren't born then. So when, when all this occurred, when all this happened, you weren't born. So um, your mum, did she know of the risk when they created you, when they made you, presumably. Yeah, so by mid-1985, both my mum and dad were aware that my dad was infected with HIV. And, you know, it, 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 from what I've been told by my mother and, and, and others, that presents a lot of difficulties. And certainly, you know, in 1987, um, there was an article in the Tamworth Herald that I saw recently, actually, but... My mum was sacked from her job because people where she worked found out and they were essentially scared that she would get HIV and then they might get HIV. And there was this whole fear of AIDS at the time mm. that was just out of control, basically. That was back in the times before, um, you know, anybody had any information on this and you just assume that you could get it from shaking somebody's hand or somebody sneezing on you or something like that the ignorance surrounding it then uh all that all that time ago it must have been awful to have been treated like that yeah i, I think what what really didn't help was um you know some people might remember the the government campaign at the time the whole aids don't die of ignorance with the falling tombstones and the scary music and you know, that was essentially the message, don't die of ignorance. If you've got AIDS, you're ignorant, you're a drug user, you're an undesirable, you're this, you're that. And so here you had this group of people, um, the haemophilia community, who weren't IV drug users, yet because the, the government's campaign centred around that, you know, you were some kind of deviant or something if you had AIDS, that was how people were, were, were branded. And I think for a lot of people it really just drove them underground drove them into silence um you know in the tamworth herald article i just mentioned there's a quote that my dad gave to them where he said it's like having a cowbell around my neck you know everywhere i go ringing out saying i've got aids and 
I think that's part of the reason why it's probably held this back for so long, why it is an untold story, because people were just driven into complete silence mm. through fear of it being known they've they've got this disease. So how did your mum and dad cope with that then, once they found out that this is what you had? Um, how did they deal with it? How did they cope? I think it was just a really, really difficult time um, for for them and, and, and for everyone else. And, you know, as I say, my mum lost her job and I think they just, you know, went to ground themselves and, and, and kind of didn't want to tell anybody else about it because they knew what that meant you know when you told people and and how you were seen and you know even people being funny about shaking hands with you or sharing glasses with you when you go around their house or or whatever the case may be it was really you know the, there's that expression you know treated like a leper but i think this was worse than that mm. actually it was far worse than that and and so i think it was just a really difficult time and you know come 1989 the the year i was born you know they they took a they took a risk and you know fortunately it 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 it, it paid off i guess and my mum wasn't infected and i wasn't infected and in hindsight you know from what we know now about hiv through um, heterosexual intercourse the the risk is is something like one in 2500 so mm. i wouldn't say that's a small risk but it's i suppose it's certainly not necessarily a high risk either but back then that they wouldn't have known those odds would they they wouldn't have known that so to no. them it, it, it you know it must have been a risk mustn't it to, in their heads but you must have been dearly wanted <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for them to uh, have, have done that and how long is it after and uh, till you know once you've been you're born can they check for it did they check for you straight away so it's it's quite interesting actually on my um my medical records from when i was born there's big biohazard stamps over all of them and um the, one of the first things that happened when i was born was that i was tested for hiv um and hey that's my own little unique birth story i guess and yeah, fortunately I wasn't. And you're right, at that time, they, you know, my mum and dad would not have known the exact risks mm. of, of of what they were doing. And, you know, other members of my mum's family have said, you know, you were the most wanted baby at, at that time. Mm. And, you know, because I, I guess, you know, it's natural to, to want what you can't have in a, in a sense. And, um, hey, you know, I'm I'm glad I'm here and I'm, I'm glad it, you know, paid off in the end. Um, it's just a shame that, uh, you know, I only had four years with my dad before that was kind of the family gone. And what were those four years like? What was he like as a person? I mean, luckily, he and my mum took a lot of um, home videos and things before uh, he died, which is, is, is great to have to look back on. And, you know, now, especially with the campaign and everything that's been going on a lot of his um well some of his old friends have got in touch with me and have told me stories about him and whatnot but really in terms of my actual memories you know I remember the last time I saw him on his deathbed basically you know he's dying at his parents house I didn't really have any uh sense of how serious you know what was happening was happening I, I remember the last time i saw him was on his birthday uh, on my birthday sorry um uh, my fourth birthday and you know i can remember just being stood there with i think i had like a game boy or something in my hands and uh you know he was just in the bed and i had no idea you know really what was happening but i definitely think what's different is i remember being at the funeral as well and I definitely remember, even though I was so young, I, the memory of that is very vivid. And I knew then there was something serious because I can remember just being sat in the church and seeing my nan crying, my, my dad's mom, and just seeing all these people crying. And yeah, it was, I knew then something 
serious had happened, you know, in my life and his life. But you couldn't, at that young age, compute what? Are you like him? I mean, a lot of his old friends say that I, I look like him and I have his mannerisms and stuff like that. In fact, that's something my mum always says. She always says, you have your dad's mannerisms. Um, but I don't know. I think I think pr- probably where me and my dad differ is I'm not sure you would have necessarily caught him, you know, on BBC West Midlands. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, you know, I think we have some things in common. Yeah. Know. Yeah. And how did they meet your mum and dad? What, um, you know, where were they? What brought them together? I think it was just, you know, a typical dance, you know, back in the 1980s where, where I guess people actually had to go out to meet each other, not be on Facebook or whatnot. And um, yeah, you know, they met each other at some kind of disco dance situation and they went from there. And, you know, my mum says until hiv came along you know it was it was the best of times and and that is what ruined everything Mm. basically Mm. what did he do uh he he always wanted to be a carpenter originally and um you know it it was funny because it was one of those things that a person with hemophilia you know can do but at that time it probably wasn't too advisable to be swinging around lots of weight and using saws and power tools and all these things so it but but that's what he wanted to do and he did that you know for a while um he eventually he worked um actually in uh salco in in birmingham um in, in in sales for a time as well and you know some of his old colleagues from back then have been in touch with me um following i was in bbc panorama back in Mm. may and you know, people saw me on there and got in touch. And it's great. You know, I, I love hearing from from people that he knew and from his past because it, it allows me to, you know, find out more about him that I might not necessarily know. It must be incredible that, you know, people come forward to tell you little tales about him, little stories about him, things they remember about him. It helps to build, you know, a bigger picture as shortly, uh, you know, yet the four years, just four years with him. How did your mum cope? With all of this, because I mean, it, it you know, it, to watch your husband go through that and to know that, you know, because we all want our partners to be around forever, but to be there uh, and you know that this isn't going to be the case. How did she cope? I think, you know, it must have just been so difficult, especially, you know, now I'm I'm at the age I am, you know, I'm 28 years old now and my dad was 31 years old when he died. And so I'm coming up to the same age now and those thoughts play on my mind you know could I imagine being this age and and going through something like that and and trying to you know I think going through something like that trying to find some sense of justice or 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 that would probably be the last thing on your mind because you're thinking about am I even going to be here in two or three years time and yeah you know it's very difficult for for my mom and for everybody you know my dad's parents as well I can't Imagine what they went through and his his family. It's just, yeah. And all the other families affected by this as well. Um, did anybody used to speak about you? You've already said about your mum's workplace and uh, what happened there because people were fearful of your dad having uh, HIV. And did, did people gossip about this? Did people mutter about it? Is you, you say that you'd gone underground or the family had gone underground. Were you judged? You, your mum, the family as a whole, what, did, you, did you feel judged by people? I mean, I, I certainly, the first time I knew anything about this was hearing someone in primary schools, uh, you know, refer to me as um, the AIDS kid. And I didn't know what AIDS was. I didn't know anything. I think there's probably maybe year three of primary school, year four of primary school, some somewhere around there. And, you know, I had to then go home and ask my mum, you know, what, why would someone say that? What is AIDS? And, you know, she's there trying to explain to, you know, however old I was, maybe nine, eight, something like that, all of this stuff. And I don't know what she said, but I'm sure she explained it, you know, as well as you can to someone of that age. And yeah, you know, it took me a long time to know about AIDS and about haemophilia and what happened. You know, it wasn't until I was a teenager that I even knew what haemophilia was. 
So it's been a long learning curve for me to find out even just the basics of what happened. And you found out yourself, did you, presumably? You you researched it? Yeah, I, was, I suppose it was around, um, you know, my teens when I started to, you know, quiz my mum about, you know, what actually happened to, to dad? How did he actually die, you know? And, and she'd, you know, tell me bits and a lot of it would go over my head because it was all new to me and... I'd then, you know, go away on the computer, start typing stuff in. Okay, that's what haemophilia is. That's what factor eight is. And over time, you know, building up this this picture, um, and, and I had a basic understanding, but it was really, you know, in 2015 that I decided to, to do something uh, about it. And as your mum always, you know, supported you through all of this as she sort of encouraged you down this journey you know she tells me regularly you know I'm, I'm very proud and your dad would be proud and and so do his friends and all this kind of thing and and, and you know on on that note you know a lot of people um trying to attribute you know where we're, where we're at with the campaign and the inquiry to me and give me the credit and you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that, but I think really, you know, there's been a lot of people involved in this. We've had help from a lot of MPs, um, you know, cross-party support, um, a lot of stars aligned at the right time. And also, you know, our, our legal team, Colin Solicitors in Watford, have just been amazing. You know, they backed us at a time when we had no inquiry, we had no press, we had really nothing. And and they got behind this and Des, Danny, Barbara in reception and their whole team has just been amazing, you know, and, and just supported us from day one. And, and so there's a lot of people that have, have been involved in this. People, in fact, that campaigned before I was even involved in this. People regularly tell me about a gentleman called Hayden Lewis who was infected with HIV and did a lot of work on this. Caroline Martin on BBC WM 95.6. Radio for the West Midlands. Good afternoon, it's Lunch with Caroline Martin. Real life story today, we're talking to Jason Evans, who's a Tamworth man. We're going to call you that because you lived there for four years, so we're keeping you, we're taking you. Uh, Now, uh, Jason was four years old when his father, Jonathan, died from HIV. Now, this was after being given contaminated blood to treat his haemophilia. And his father was one of thousands who were infected in the late 70s and early 80s. And we're still not sure how many died, but it is likely to be hundreds. Now, Jason is uh, now leading a campaign to find out how this was able to happen and who should be held accountable. Uh, And we've heard a bit of uh, Jason's backstory. So you were telling us just before the news that you've got a good team around you uh, and you've all been brought together because you've all been personally affected. Yeah, I mean, we're we're all working together, you know, to, to move this forward and it's it's amazing you know that the people you meet and the stories that you hear and people from all walks of life that have done all different jobs and different things from all around the country and um it's it it is incredible really that you know everyone's now coming together to try and move this forward and there's no agenda other than to to get to the truth and to get justice and you know the the people that I'm in contact with some of whom will be listening to this um you know you know they're all everyone's got their part to play and i think if we keep moving forward the way we are we we're, we're going to get to a a place that maybe won't bring us full closure i don't think you can ever have that but might be able to bring some peace to people that have been struggling for a very long time how does it feel to hear from someone else that's been affected by this because on the one hand it's good that you can all relate to one another and share your stories but you know as as each person comes forward I guess on the other side of the coin it's somebody else's life that's been destroyed by what happened here yeah it's you know it's it, I think it's great that people are able to connect and share their stories and, and I think that helps um a lot of people to know they're not alone but you know even this past weekend um, 
you know a number of us met up in in London um and you know I spoke to a, a gentleman there who lived in in complete isolation for for years until very recently uh, more or less his entire life actually and um there's a lot of people like that you know it's such a common story that people have just lived in complete isolation complete silence for decades why i think it's the the stigma um particularly of hiv but you know with hepatitis c as well and people are just just don't want other people to know they've they've got this these viruses but certainly you know i i would say to to anyone and perhaps this is easy for me to say as someone who isn't infected but is affected is you know it's been one of the most uh, freeing things i've ever done to just turn around and and to just say to the world you know you can either accept this is a, a thing that happened it's part of my life and you know uh you know love me or leave me alone i guess is one way mm. to put it but yeah you know i think people shouldn't be scared to speak out about this this is a thing that happened it wasn't their fault they didn't do anything to deserve this it was you know these billion dollar pharmaceutical companies and the government ultimately um that are possibly responsible for this and i think perhaps another reason why this this story is so unknown or the detail of it to the general public in a way that say for instance the grenfell tower fire people are very familiar with that people mm. know what happened they know about the cladding and, and whatnot but but with this story, it's largely unknown, and I think a big reason is that, um, you know, when people do interviews, etc., especially if they're pre-recorded, any mention of the company is responsible, and don't worry, I'm not mm. going to say their names, <laughs> um, but that goes. Yeah. And so right now, I know the name of the company that made the product that infected my father with HIV. It's a very well-known company uh, that actually these days is in the cosmetics industry that if i was to say to any uh young lady name your five uh, name five top brands of lipstick they would name this company but i can't say the name mm. of that company anywhere because essentially the media outlets are, are afraid of the the legal consequences and so like myself people know the names of the companies that essentially have killed their loved ones but we can't say it we can't say who's responsible for our loved one's deaths and so that also holds us back from telling this story and how did you feel when david cameron uh, apologized to the victims i think it was i don't want to say it was an empty gesture i i think actually that for all his sins, David Cameron probably did want to do something about this. Mm. But the, ultimately, it's the civil, the senior civil service behind him and all other ministers and prime ministers that have got in the way of this. And I think David Cameron was probably well-intentioned, but had his hands tied. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of people don't appreciate his apology that he made it was very rushed during pmqs one day and th there was there was nothing behind the apology and that that upsets um you know a lot of people i speak to as well that you know we, we've never we're talking about thousands of people that have, have died and there's no, never a minute silence there's no national memorial there's nothing it, it's the largest loss of life disaster since the 1950s and there's no record anywhere in the country, really, that it ever happened. It's completely dismissed. So they're not remembered. The people are not remembered. People don't even know, really, unless you research it, what it is all about or what occurred or what was apparently covered up. They, they're they just ignorant of it. And as you say, a massive loss of life. Exactly. I mean, I mean one... Um, young lady that I met not so long ago said to me you know I think I asked her you know what 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 do you want out, out of this you know what would you like to see happen and she said all I want is just for my dad's name to be on a wall somewhere so that he's remembered and what happened was remembered and you know you almost just think wow you know that's 
that's all some people want. They just want this to be known, to be remembered. And and we can't even do that. Thousands of people, and, and, and we can't even do that. And, you know, I don't know what that says about us, uh, not necessarily as a country, but what that says about the government when it's something that perhaps they'd rather not be remembered, that perhaps when the truth is known will be a stain on the history of this country. And talking of young ladies, because you just mentioned one there, could you tell us about a lady called Lauren Palmer? Sure. So, you know, it was shortly after um, Panorama back in May, you know, a a lot of people, you know, had gotten in touch with me. And and there was one in particular that I think, uh, you know, sorry, Lauren, if you're listening to this, but, you know, she she's told, you know, her her story. But she's um, I think she's just, you know, number one, just an incredible person for, for going through what she's gone through. But also, I just think her story sums up. The, the the tragedy that, that, that this is, if, if you can even call it that. So her father, like my father, was a haemophiliac, uh, infected with HIV and probably hepatitis C as well. And he unwittingly infected her mother as well with HIV. And both of her parents died when she was nine years old. Mm. And, you know, you, you hear stories like that and you just think, you know the government really have no idea what a lot of people have 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 gone through um but look Lauren's come out the 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 other side of it and and she she's at a, a, you know a great place in life but there's a lot of just the worst kind of stories and you know I I've, I speak to you know other women who were infected by their their husbands or their partners at points in time where they hadn't been told about their infections and just the the fallout of this is just huge and you know I can see why the government the companies etc wouldn't want to shout about this wouldn't want to remember this because it it has been catastrophic to so many people and we're hoping now that this inquiry can shed some light officially on Mm. what happened. Is that what you want? Is that what you're striving for? Answers for more people to to know and recognise that this happened? Absolutely. I mean, when I first got into this, the the main thing that was at the forefront of my mind was uh, there was an inquiry called the Penrose Inquiry in Scotland. Um, and that was a Scottish inquiry. It couldn't compile witnesses and documents outside of Scotland. Uh, there was quite a bit wrong with it. And on the day the final report for that inquiry came out, I, you know, booked the day off work, had the TV on, and I remember watching the the live stream of the final report. And the spokesperson, it was kind of this one sentence that that's always stuck with me, and it was that. Um, The inquiry found that nothing or very little could or should have been done differently, which, you know, it says a lot about that inquiry, given the evidence that's come to light now and and the evidence that was there even before, to to be perfectly honest. However, um, the thing that stuck in my mind was when that statement has changed to actually there's a hell of a lot that could and should have been done differently, very differently. That's when I think we can say, okay, we've reached the place now where we've got the truth on record. When actually the government turn around and say this was avoidable, that mistakes were made, uh, that there was negligence, that there is liability, then I think people can have some sense of closure. Do you think that will happen? I honestly really do. I think... For, for the first time in a long time, this campaign and everyone affected by it, you know, is, is coming together. I feel like we've got the wind in our sails. I feel like we're moving forward towards something. You know, a lot of people ask me, where is this going? What's going to be the outcome? I don't know. But 
I just feel like we're heading in the right direction. And I think a lot of people feel that way as well. And look, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna stop, you know, and, and until we get some form of closure, until there's some form of of public acknowledgement of what really happened here. Your dad would, I guess, be proud of you for what you're doing. I mean, I'd hope so. You know, I'd I'd, I'd hope so. Um, I just feel. There's this thing inside me that, that that just powers me to fight this fight, which is really strange because, you know, even five years ago, if you'd have said to me about going to meetings at, in Parliament or the Cabinet Office and going to the High Court and all this sort of stuff, I would have thought you... <laughs> I don't know what I would have thought, but I wouldn't have thought it was going to... You know, but, but sometimes I guess life just takes you off in a completely different direction. And and when I began to really look at the evidence and, and, and whatnot, I just felt that it was something I had to do, as many others have. And, and, you know. So you say, you know, five years ago, this wasn't the path that you were on. How have you got to this point then? What Tell us about you. What do you like to do? What are you what's your job? Tell us about you. I mean, my uh, my my day to day job is uh, you know marketing, and uh, but I've you know I've always had a passion for music as well, which which I do in my um you know when I have time to do it these days. That is, um, has that helped you music? Because it can help in various situations a lot, can't it? Oh, you know, massively, massively, and I think um, some of the things I learned through music have helped massively with the campaign you know i think for instance um having the experience of being on a stage in front of a crowd has has perhaps helped me to not completely wilter into a mess um at times like this <laughs> you know so do you sing then or are you in a band uh you know i've made mu- music for, for for some time in in the hip-hop world and um you know it's it's funny because a lot of people um before any of this happened and before i i kind of went public with this it, it, you know if, if you like i only only knew me for for my music and i think it opened up the eyes of those people as well to like you know wow this is something we'd never heard of before likewise with my friends you know um they didn't know a lot of them didn't know anything about this and they were kind of taken aback by everything but you know i've got i've got to say that things must be different now yeah. from how they were in the 1980s because everyone that's around me um you know my friends family even people that don't know me from adam have been nothing but supportive actually and so you know things must must be different now and, and that can only be a good thing What's different about you and this, Jason, because I've talked about this with people before, but you have put it across in a way that it makes sense because it can be compl- it, it confusing. It can be complicated when you've got numbers flying left, right and centre. People are wondering, what is what, what, what does that all mean? But you have come on, you've explained it, you've said exactly what it is, exactly what went wrong, and people get it. I think that sometimes people just need it spelled out to them, don't they, in, in, in simple terms, because it's horrendous. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the problem is that it, it's a very complex story, mm. and you know, th- there's a lot to it. There's and and you can get pulled off in all these different directions about, you know, blood plasma was harvested in prisons in America and corpses in Russia, and you had these companies involved from here, there, and everywhere, from Haiti to the U.S. to Mexico and. All, all these different names and government officials and there's so many moving parts to this story um and i think also is that you know when you're speaking to people that have got life-threatening conditions people that are, are dying they've got so much to say uh and I, I think it just can be completely over overwhelming mm. for people but but having said that i think there's actually um you know, a number of people that that tell the story extremely well, actually, that, that are directly affected by this. But you're right, it's, it's a complex story and there's there's a lot to it. And um, 
I hope that I've managed to explain it in some simple way anyway. I think you most certainly have. And how's your mum? She's fine, thank you. Yeah, she's um, in, in Scotland at the minute, actually, I think, visiting friends. But yeah, she's very well, thank and, you. And did she find happiness? Did she, I mean, because going through something like this, I mean, she has you, who obviously she uh, is proud of and loves. Did she carry on with life? She did. And I, I think she's, you know, at a happy place in her life right now. And I think it's certainly um, an easier time now than it was back then but no I think she's a you know a happy place in life definitely well listen we are so glad that you came in and you told us about it anybody that does want to know more anybody that has heard what you've got to say because as you said there's lots more to it and there's more details that you can't talk about on here uh, that you could perhaps give to them how do they find you what where can they get you Sure. So our website for the Factor 8 campaign, uh, which is the campaign group that I'm a part of, is Factor 8, the number 8, Factor 8 Scandal dot UK. And if there is anyone listening who's affected by this at this point in time with the inquiry and the group legal actions as well, I would recommend speaking to Colin solicitors who are representing uh, victims and bereaved families. I thank you very much uh, for coming in, Jason. Come back and see us again. And uh, I, I wish you well with this. And I hope that you do get the answers that you seek.